Welcome to Sarah Mokel's BFA exhibition, Mountain Mountain Moon. If that's what you're looking for, you're in the right place. If that isn't what you're looking for, please stay with us anyways. And I'll, what I always like to kick these off with is even though we are virtual and all in different physical locations, I always like to start with a land acknowledgement. And I do that for Sierra Nevada University and Incline Village, because that's kind of right where we're do, doing this out of, even if we're not physically there. And so SNU and Incline Village sits on traditional Washoe land. The Washoe people have lived thrived and stewarded this land long before the university and continues to do so. So we acknowledge the Washoe people for their care of this land and pay respects to elders past and present. And I encourage you all to um, look up the native land that you're on because most of us are on unceded indigenous land and honor those who have um, come before us and continue to be here. So, for those of you who don't already know me and haven't heard this spiel a ton of times, I'm going to give it again. Um, my name is Anza. I use the pronouns they, them, and I'm the gallery director here at Sierra Nevada University here, wherever here may be. And um, Sierra Nevada University is a small private liberal arts college. We're located two blocks from the North Shore of Lake Tahoe. And we are part of the fine arts department here, which has our undergraduate BA and BFA, as well as our MFA low residency and interdisciplinary arts program. And the galleries at SNU are thrilled to be kicking off our BFA season tonight with Sarah's exhibition. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the BFAs are an integral tradition and rite of passage here in the SNU art department. To complete a BFA here, a student will take an additional 15 credits in a selected concentration. And in addition to that, so they're already taking more classes, they then also complete this solo exhibition that they're creating work for, installing it, and then presenting. And at most institutions, if a BFA student has a final show, it's usually a group show that they have little say over. So this solo exhibition opportunity is intimidating, thrilling, overwhelming, exhausting, exciting, magical, and potentially even life-changing. So um, tonight is a big night. And those of us who have been through the process and have overseen the process or our peers of people who have gone through the process know what the literal blood, sweat, and tears that go into these processes. And so it is no small feat to get to tonight. And I really want to congratulate Sarah on all of the hard work that has gotten her to this point, both through her entire time at SNU and then also just getting a show together because both of those things are huge and we know it. And I could gush about Sarah and what an honor it has been to be her professor and mentor and also work with her as the gallery director, but I'm not gonna do all that because why we're all actually here is to hear from her. So at this point, I will hand over the metaphorical virtual floor to Sarah. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, thank you, Anza. So hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Mokel, and I've been using the pronouns she, they. This is my fourth year at SNU getting my BFA with a minor in sustainability, which ends up having a pretty big impact on a lot of my art. Um, I wanna first just quickly add to Anza's acknowledgement. I have not been on the campus this semester. So I wanna just quickly acknowledge that the work I'm showing you tonight was made on the lands of the Shasta tribe, the Stiligwamish, the Duwamish, the Ramutish, Ohlone, and the Miwakma tribes. I also want to thank some people really quickly. Thank you first, of course, to everyone who's here, um, and especially thank you to my teachers from SNU. My BFA committee has been so amazing and supportive this semester. Um, I want to thank my friends who've supported me this year and just throughout my life, Isabel, Marion, Bree, and Brian, and everyone from school and the Social Justice Club and Climate Alliance. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank my parents um, who have been the most encouraging and I'm just so proud to come from such amazing people. Um, and then one final thing, I want to dedicate my show to my grandparents. Um, we lost my dad's parents this last December and January. So if you do enjoy tonight, this was for my mom and papa and I wish they could have made it. 
Um, but so thank you so much for coming to Mountain Mountain Moon. Um, Alrighty, so I'm gonna start by taking you guys back in time a little bit to last summer. I started thinking a lot about time for some reason. Um, I personally spend a lot of my time thinking about the past, but I think that COVID brought on this like wave of nostalgia that had everyone looking through old photos and thinking about the past. Um, and I became fixated on wanting to visualize all of history in perspective so that I could understand the scale of time, which is like really bold concept. But I started going through all the events I could remember from old history classes and all those dates that I like could never memorize um, and went from there with timelines I found on the internet and whatever question I would think of that day and tried to think of a way to display all this info um, dating back to the Big Bang to scale so that you could understand the lifetime of the dinosaurs compared to yourself or comprehend what was happening in the childhood of your grandparents. And it took me quite a while, I have to admit, to understand that this wasn't as feasible as I had initially hoped. Um, it's really hard to fit a billion years next to a decade on the same piece of paper um, and not have one of them a really inconvenient size. So I changed the scale a little bit and ended up creating this, um, which I've been calling my chronograph. Um, and I learned a couple of things from doing this. The first is that I could finally place myself in time and understand how much was actually behind me and relate it all to each other. Another thing I realized is that history is long, uh, which I know sounds like super obvious, but when you really take a second to think about how long a billion years is and that our universe has been around for 15 billion years, it's hard for me not to also start thinking about our history as humans. Um, in Joanna Macy's book, Active Hope, she explains that if the history of the earth, which was only 5 billion years, um, were scaled to a day, that humans would only exist for the last five seconds. So if we did that for the whole 15 billion years, I don't think we'd even get a full second. Um, which to me means that anything we think of as having always been um, hasn't even come close. So around this same time, I started having more and more conversations with friends and family on topics related to social justice and climate change um, and changes that I or they had wished to see. But many of these conversations seemed to go a similar way with the people I was talking to being convinced that whatever change we wished for was impossible uh, because things are just fixated this way and it's too hard for change. Um, and I would think back to my chronograph and end up really confused. I was thinking like, why aren't we having so much trouble believing that things can change? And why aren't we taking creative steps to imagine these different realities? And maybe it's the fact that I'm an art student, um, but I did start thinking that about creativity and that maybe we're losing our ability to be creative and use our imagination. A large part of my thinking about this wants to blame technology because it has sped up our lives so much that we don't take the time to wonder anymore. If we do wonder anything, we can have the, sec the answer in a couple seconds. So we're not really taking the time anymore to activate our imagination. Another part of, that I think about this is that stigma around creativity, that it's like childish or only for artists. Um, but creativity is a fundamental human skill. Um, we're all born with it and we can either foster and nourish it or let it diminish until it becomes something kind of unrecognizable. Creativity is something that I've struggled with a lot. <laughs> and I know some of you might scoff at me for saying that, but it is the truth. Um, I've struggled for a long time to identify as creative, even more so after starting my art degree. Um, but I started to realize that maybe the disconnect from my creative self that I was feeling, others were too. So, and it might factor into our ability to grapple with the vastness of climate change and issues related to social justice. And I just really quickly wanna state that I'm gonna talk about these things the way I just did in that really broad sense um, that's not because I'm naive to the many issues that fall under the climate change and social justice umbrella, but quite the contrary. I see them as immensely complicated and connected subjects that have an enormity beyond our comprehension. 
there's a trend in the sustainability department and just our society in general to feel like you need to pick one issue. Um, in Van Jones' TED Talk, he says it as, you have to boil your love down to one issue. Um, and this is something I've struggled with from the beginning. So for me, getting to think about creativity has been a way to kind of think about all of it at once um, and address everything. So I was thinking all of this and thinking about tonight having my show, um, and I ended up doing two things um, toward tonight. I sent out a survey to see if others felt similar to me, and I committed myself to becoming more creative, um, which I know is like a really bold thing to say, <laughs> um, but that was my goal. I wanted to see if I could find a way to practice creativity and if it would benefit me in any way. And it took me a while to figure out what I was going to do, but I knew I wanted to start a daily creative practice. And I was finally able to settle on the idea of generating a mountain, mountain moon for every day of January. Um, and I look, had looked back at old work um, over the past few years and found this reoccurring pattern of mountainscapes and moons or space um, and didn't want to really commit myself to one medium. So I chose that word generate to give myself a little bit of wiggle room. But January 1st started and I started that day and it definitely was not easy at first. For probably at least the first week, it felt very much like a chore and was hard to get myself to do it. Um, some of those days are my most basic generations. I did like a Snapchat drawing from bed and this pencil sketch. Um, but, and there were days I missed but I always ended up making those days up the next time I was doing one. So there's a couple of sets of days. Um, but by the time it was February, I continued doing daily mountain mountain moons naturally. And I continued them daily for probably a little over a week before I tried to commit myself to just doing something creative each day. Um, so I'm no longer doing these daily. I have been more inclined to pick up the supplies here and there and have continued making some all the way through March. So the last photos you'll see go um, into February through March. And so I obviously don't have like any hard evidence, only my observations, but this experience or exercise, however you'd like to call it, I think was ultimately effective in fostering my creativity. I've noticed that recently I've been giving things another go when I usually might've given up sooner. After this slideshow, I'll show you a quick little um, stop motion that I made that went through about four different renditions before I settled on the version it is now. And I know usually how I would be normally when my first idea doesn't work out, I just kind of give up. But this time I stuck with the idea until I had a finished piece. Um, the other place that I feel um, I felt a little more creative has been in the kitchen actually. Um, I've made a lot more meals re recently without a recipe, and I'm not usually one to follow a recipe to the T, but I've lately not even been using one and trying to just look around our pantry and, and make something up. Um, so far, no complaints. <laughs> um, um, so I would say that I've become a lot more resourceful after consciously practicing my creativity. As I continued to work with the concept of the mountains and moons, I started to understand a deeper meaning they might have for me. In sustainability, we talk a lot about the way we wish the world was and how we could work toward change, but this can be really hard to comprehend, trying to envision a new world while being trapped in this one. So the mountains provide a visual metaphor for me of the many hurdles and challenges we face and the idea that they're all connected to each other and an understanding that there is another side to this, even if we can't see it from here. It is the journey ahead. I also like the symbolism of the triangle, which is probably about the only thing I remember from high school chemistry as being the shorthand for change. So that abstracted triangle shape of the mountains ends up being a direct symbol for change. The moon and just the sky and space in general speaks to the past for me. When we look up at the sky, we're looking into the past. We see a moon that's a few seconds behind us and the sun we see is about eight minutes old. And when we look up at the stars, sometimes we're seeing light bouncing back from millions of years ago. This makes me think back to my chronograph and our lack of comprehension of the scale of time. And I think about the moon reflecting the sun's light back at us and how maybe we'd benefit from some reflection ourselves. But they also, for me, speak to the accessibility of creativity. 
Like I said, I've never been very confident in my creative abilities, but the mountains and moons feel accessible to me because I think of them as a few squiggly lines and circles, and that ends up feeling really achievable. The biggest concept encompassing all of this idea, all of this for me is the idea of vastness. I get a similar feeling when looking out over a grand landscape as I do when thinking about the enormity of climate change or the broad range of social justice issues relevant today. It may be different in that one situation is associated with positivity, the enjoying of a view, and the other negativity, that stress, but there's still the same sense of vastness of these concepts. So this, there's just a few more photos here. Sorry, my timing is fast. Okay, and then so that time lapse I had just mentioned, here's this, it's just four seconds, so it'll repeat itself. Right. Um, so I want to loop back around to my survey that I had just mentioned. Um, I sent out a survey about a month ago, asking questions about creativity and trying to see if there were any correlations between our feelings of our own creative abilities and our stresses associated with social justice and climate change issues. And so I got about 100 responses and pulled my data together. The first question I asked was people's age. Um, so out of my 100 responses, this was the age distribution. I think it's kind of expected coming out of sending it from a college. Um, and then the second question I asked was for people to identify the time in their life that they think they were their most creative. And almost a third answered that that time was in their childhood, which is what I had anticipated, but was pleased to see that it wasn't quite as many people as I thought, um, but it was still a good amount of people were identifying that creativity as being behind them in life. Um, this slide is a little confusing, but I think it's really cool. This is a diagram that shows how people answered from one question to the next. So it seems like um, what I'm calling the adult range, this 30 to 35, were the most likely to identify themselves as currently in their creative stage. Alrighty. Uh, my third question was, do you think of yourself as creative? And I got a pleasant response of mostly agrees, which was exciting. Um, but then I asked people if they often identify themselves as creative in job interviews or things like that, and the data shifted a bit. Many people, even if they might think they're creative, will not describe themselves as creative. Um, this is where I usually fall, not feeling very confident in my creative abilities, not enough to like advertise myself as such. So over 50 people had said agree or, um, sorry, over 50 people said they agree to thinking of themselves as creative, even more so if we include the people who had said strongly agree but then less than half of the people agree or strongly agree to describing themselves as creative, um, which that's where I fall, but it was still kind of sad to gather the data and confirm it. <laughs> um, okay. oh. So I've worked, I've wanted to work with data for a while. A lot of my work is very data driven um, and I was really attached to the data from this survey. So I was going through all of my responses and feeling really connected to the data. I was trying to like guess whose response it was, if it was a friend or if I saw a response that I thought was kind of sad, I really wanted to like reach out to that person and tell them it was all gonna be okay. Um, but I was really seeing my data as this beautiful thing and wanted to see if I could try and honor that beauty. So I created these, um, these are my abstracted datascapes. Um, we're just going to sit with these for a moment, um, and while we do, if it's convenient for you to use the chat, I'm going to ask you to drop a few creative practices in there. Um, so you can do this with a group if you're with people, but I'd love for us to brainstorm some creative practices that we could do, some daily creative practices people can try and do. Um, this can include anything from painting to gardening, even just having a conversation is practicing creativity. So try and think outside the box. We'll take a minute to look at these and just try and get in the chat if you can. Oh wow, I'm seeing these pop in, these are wonderful.
Yes, roller skating, a lot of um, just like outdoor activities is being creative. Um, if you really think about it, sliding down a slope is creativity. So take advantage of your creativity where it is in your life. <laughs> All righty. Um, wow. Thank you guys. So yeah, keep them coming. Um, I will think I'm gonna move on to my video, but yeah, keep that chat going. That's awesome. Okay, so I just have one more set of pieces to show you guys tonight. Um, the first is my video. Um, so for me, this video is an amalgamation of all the ideas I've been having since the beginning of thinking about this show. It has themes of the passing of time, a concept of a journey. And for me, it was just kind of a playground for my imagination and creativity to see if I could try and find a way to personify it. Um, without further ado, if you will just give me a moment to tackle some audio transition issues, this video is Why Is It Always Lemonade? So hold on. <laughs>
Okay, um, I'm going to assume that there were some glitchy issues potentially there were on my end. If that is true, everything you're seeing tonight is on my website. And so we'll be, oh, Anza just dropped that link um, in there. So if you need to check out the video again, it's going to be on my website under um, why is it always lemonade in the BFA show section. Um, cool. So that video goes along with a set of paintings under the same title, um, trying to in trying to think about how to activate my creativity. I had stumbled upon this new affinity for lemons, um, and I was trying to think of other things I could do with a lemon. And so, um, how could I use a lemon for art? So I had fashioned this lemon roller here. Um, and these paintings came out of that little experiment, um, some little lemon scapes, if you will. Um, and if it hasn't already come to mind, I started thinking about the classic saying, when life gives you lemons, uh, make lemonade. And trying to think back and trying to tie things back to thinking about my creativity, I had the thought, you know, why is it always lemonade? And I know life has been giving us a lot of lemons lately. So I hope to use my art to inspire people to see creativity as a valuable asset in our ongoing um, survival in this world. And that maybe one day we can make something other than lemonade. So thank you all so, so much for coming to my show. And I want to wish the best of luck to Hannah and Deja whose shows are coming up. And I know they're gonna do amazing. Um, I know I talk a little fast, but thank you so much for coming. And I think we'll move into questions in a minute here. Yeah, take this moment to just congratulate Sarah. That was amazing. So, yay. We are going to open it for questions. And how we like to do questions is if you have a question, you can type question into the chat and we'll call on you and you can unmute and ask it yourself. Anyone wanna kick our questions off? Because I know people are gonna have questions after some of the things we just saw. Um, I have a question, Sarah, about the the piece that you did the pano of. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Um, yeah, I'm assuming you're talking about my chronograph, uh, which is a, a word I just recently learned actually. It's like a diagram of history, which is such a cool word. I didn't even know it was a real thing that I had made one. Um, but that piece came out of this summer. I I think I, you know, I was COVID, I was cooped up and I was like, I need something to do and got fixated on finally understanding history <laughs> um, and putting it all into perspective and understanding like, all right, so how long has the earth been here? How, how fast does everything change all the time? Um, and I actually saved a couple detail shots here. One of my favorite slides is this one from that, um, which is kind of a zoom in on the big chunk of evolution. Um, and it even goes through the, the different continents as they shifted, but I'm not sure what details you want. This piece is about trying to get it all there and visualize so that I can look at it and say, okay, that's how long that took compared to this other thing. That's how far away that is from me in terms of history. Um, and started just the framework of my trying to understand, can the world change? How fast does the world change? And and yeah, getting it all in a visual format. But hopefully that gets you a little more insight into my, my brain there, Hannah. Julia, you have a question. Yeah, um, I just, I, I've seen you work in a lot of different mediums and I, I really miss seeing you on campus and seeing your work in person. Um, I was just curious, you mentioned you had a lot of different, you tried a lot of different mediums when you did all your mountain, mountain moons from January and on. So I was wondering if you had a favorite out of those. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was told you'd ask for favorites. <laughs> um, I think I 
like using X-Acto knives. Um, and I actually don't even have X-Acto knives. I was given some surgical knives by my uncle. So I have actual scalpels that I use on paper very often. So that's some of these, oh, my mirrored. Is, so some of these are paper cutouts and I think those are my favorites. Um, my actual favorite is not on the wall behind me, but I can pull it up for you really quick because I think that this paper cutout was my favorite medium to use. And also I think probably one of my favorite of the mountain moons and just of my pieces. So hopefully here it is. This one in the middle here, um, the white paper cutout is I think yeah. my favorite of just getting to use the knife. Um, it's something that works really well for me. Cool, beautiful. Hey, Sarah, I have a question, um, which is, uh, you know, as somebody who's been thinking about creativity a lot, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious if you've given thought to um, sort of the, the, the negative um, aspects of it. You know, we, we sort of, as artists, artists tend to couch creativity as a, as a good, right? You know, it's sort of our, um, it's our, our trick bag, right? Um, but, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, there, there, there's also negative creativity or whatever I think most commonly, uh, or <clears throat> excuse me, uh, currently I, I think of QAnon as an incredible creative exercise <laughs> is maybe not, you know, directed towards a positive outcome. So yeah, so I'm curious if, if you've given thought to like what, you know, if, if creativity isn't necessarily an inherent good, like how, you know, how, how do you identify what's working, if it is working for good or not, or, it, or, or what are the, the positive and, and sometimes negative aspects that are rolled up in it? Oh, geez, Chris, I knew you were gonna do this to me. Um, <laughs> that I, it's, it's something I've thought about, not as much as I think I, as, I, as I could have or should have. I think I kind of didn't think about that at the beginning intentionally. I, I started as I was doing research into like, creativity has to be good for everything, right? Um, when you start, not that I know much, but I'm gonna touch on it. When you start doing research into fascism and things, they start saying, maybe we shouldn't put creativity into certain components of our lives. Um, and like QAnon, maybe we don't need to encourage creativity in certain ways that might influence us um, negatively, but it's not something I've gotten around to thinking about yet. It's definitely something I know to think about if I'm going to continue pursuing, you know, encouraging creativity and trying to think about valuing it. But so far, I haven't do, like, dove into that deep end of, of how it can go wrong. <laughs> But I know, yeah, it's out there and that's, that's definitely a really good example. But I think it's, yeah, I'll get around to it for now. Creativity is amazing. Um, but yeah, if it gets into the wrong areas, that's definitely something as I continue this study, I will keep in mind. Sarah, I want to ask you um, about the continuation of this and in thinking about, and again, just try not to hold back, but also as you're hopefully feeling here, what a wonderful show, what a wonderful offering, and what a joy it's been to work with you in different spaces on campus. Try not to send the fire hose of so, so much well being your way, but just really um, excited for you and super supportive and just love this work and seeing you within all of it. And I wonder about the continuation. And I coupled with that is if I saw this on campus, some of your work hung on campus, if I saw some of these things and how that could potentially inspire further um, action amongst other peers and colleagues and students and faculty, things like that. I just see a profound potential in this impact. So I'm wondering what that what that continuation is like to you. And I know you have your website and things like that, but um, any thoughts to share on that? Cool, yeah. Um, in terms of my physical art practice, I'm definitely super excited to keep thinking about the data scapes and thinking of other data that can turn into these beautiful mountains um, and finding more ways of making data pretty art. Um, and of maybe one day trying to turn that chronograph into a much more refined digital version. 
But in terms of kind of activating a space more on campus and things like that, I think um, I hopefully will continue my education. Um, I'm actually looking at both your degree and ANSYS degrees that you guys went and did. <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, eventually I think I, if I keep the same mindset, I'd love to try and keep bringing these worlds together, um, bringing art to sustainability, sustainability to art. And, and yeah, if we could on campus or wherever I end up going, bring, bring create creative practice to the, to the space, I think is, is where I'd like to go with, with all of this. Thank you, Bernie. Yeah, an awesome answer. And just I'll say one more that as a mountain lover and the affinities I have with mountains. And I love how you have said things like when you're like, and even sliding on snow and I'm thinking of these other things and I'm like the most creative I'm, I ever am is when I'm hiking up the mountain before I come down it. And you have done that multiple times in working with you over time. You know, we get put in these positions as educators where we're the ones uh, all knowledgeable and powerful, right? And the students, when we co-create and create these spaces, you teach so much too. So I just want to um, shine that back. And also in the mountain lover sense, so many of these pieces, I could see um, other people just being able to, to see them in other places and be so inspired. So I just want to throw that out one more time. Thanks, Sarah. We have a question from Aaron. Hello, um, I'm a master's student who has never been to campus yet, but I'm so glad I tuned in for this really impressive stuff. Really, like, I, I would love to be in touch and share um, information, but I was just wondering if um, materially, I really liked how some of these were not permanent items that were going to exist forever. So, like, I'm wondering about your stance on, like, sustainability and art materials. Hmm, awesome question. And definitely we can connect. I hear great things. I think we should connect. Um, but who, um, thinking about sustainability and obviously something I've thought about from the beginning, every material that I used for my show was I obviously not sustainable, but was not bought. Um, so anything I was either I already had or um, I was given a stack of paint chips by a friend. Um, so that was about a week worth of just paint sample cut ups. Um, but for me right now, in terms of material, it's what I have um, and what I'm given. And that's, I think, where I am with sustainability. I know eventually I'd love to get to a point where I'm not using plastic and things like that. But those are currently in our society and they do need to be used maybe in some way. And if I can save something from being in the trash sooner, and turn it into something beautiful, then maybe I can do that for now. And I think in the way our world is working now, that's where I can fit with my materials and this world. You have to, you have to live in it and work toward the future. So I'm working with what I have and, and trying not to go to Michael's and things like that, but go to friends and, and go to different secondhand and things like that and, and try and work with what I have. And sometimes that means it's a lemon that's gonna be rotten next week. And other times it's my pan of onions that's dinner in 10 minutes. Um, so it's, it's sustainability I think right now is what I have with me and what I have on hand. But yeah. I, I also think that um, uh, in reference to sustainability, sustaining your art practice is really important. And, you know, sustaining your existence in the art world as well. So I just put that out there. <laughs> Congrats. Thanks. Sarah, Rick here. Yeah, hey, Rick. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, better now. Yeah, I bet so. <laughs> Great job. Um, we did a dry run yesterday, and, and the, the amazing thing is that you have this committee that's throwing all this stuff at you um, for, the, for the last two months, and, and we met every two weeks. And every time that we made a suggestion to you, you heard us, you went back, you repositioned stuff, 
thought about things and I, I'm totally impressed with your flexibility and ability to hear and kind of see what was being said to you. So I really appreciate um, that. Um, with that said, the, the idea of artists being social commentator, using some rhetorical means to kind of persuade or change, I really believe that you have been blessed with this gift um, of presenting yourself and presenting your subject matter that's believable um, and, and real and it's inherent in you. And I think you have a special gift. So as you move forward, I'd, I'd really suggest that you think about that, the artist as being social commentator. And what does that mean to, to present something to the public with the potential of making change um, beyond just an art practice, but, it, but you're working on something that's much larger than that. So as you move forward, um, think about that. What kind of form does that take? How do you present that work? Right now it's your website. How do you grow the website or grow the viewers of the website? Because I believe you have something important to say and the more people that can see it and hear it, um, the more change that will come. And I think creativity is, is a key component of that. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I have a question for you, Sarah. Yeah, Anza. So one of the things that I've learned about you is you are always asking questions and always researching things. And you just like love knowing the answers to things. And I loved it when you were one of my students because you would just like, I'd be like, I don't know what that is. And like two minutes later, you'd have looked up the answer and have it in like information for us. And I see that kind of with your work. And so my next, my question is like, what is your next question that you're researching like what's the next thing going into the google search bar or this that, creativity thought process so tough anza i have watched every ted talk there is to watch about creativity and imagination and time and all of this so man that's i think i definitely need to dive deeper into creativity chris has opened the door of the negativity of creativity which is definitely something to spiral down um but oh man i think maybe maybe some more research into data visualization um which i know maybe isn't the most exciting and romantic of topics but i think that might be where i head of not just data visualization but how can how can we beautify data uh, more often and things like that and bringing you know beauty to science and facts but yeah definitely a cool question i have kind of a follow-up question um i was curious of where you believe that time and creativity like how they coexist Oh, oh, oh man, I don't even know. I they probably have such a different. Oh God, I couldn't even tell you, Lauren. That's crazy. I feel like you've got to. Everyone has their own sense of time. So, if in your own creative practice, your your version of time and your sense of time passing is gonna maybe be conveyed in your own creative thinking. But damn, those are such big concepts that I know I talk about. And I think to think about it more, I might start thinking about, you know, our history of creativity. Um, I'd go back into our chronograph and maybe fill in, you know, when did we start the cave paintings and things like that? And what is the history of creativity? Uh, might be where I'd go with that thought, Lauren, but I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but I would love to talk to you about that for days. <laughs> That was great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that we have out there? Any ones that you've been holding it in your heart? Now is the time to just like be bold and ask the question. <laughs> yeah. What? You can, I'm just not 
answering that. Mom, did you want to articulate uh, no, your question? <laughs> that was your brother, Philip. I was, that's <laughs> Philip's question. About paint chips. Bear, the paint people. The oh, bear should paint I mark people. it with the paint people? Yeah, you can make <laughs> a marketing campaign. They totally sure, buy it. But like marketing with paint people is the most sustainable track for me right now. Well, you can <laughs> try and find their like sustainable paint. They probably have some green paint out there. They want to, they want to market that crap. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, Chris, it's Kristen who wants to know about the dragons. You got it, Sarah. You could get it, I bet. They, they'll, they'll hire you. Um, my art gallery is all going to be on the website, which maybe we can pop in the chat one more time. Um, everything is going to be available um, through my website. Sarah, did you catch that question from Kirsten? Um, when is the dragon somewhere in your mountains or from your moon? I don't have any specific dragons, I think, in my show. But if I were to have one, I think, you know, a mountain dragon is kind of cliche. So maybe a moon dragon would, would be kind of out of the box, be more a creative dragon. Um, so if that's the question, I would have a moon dragon. <laughs> Really creative final question. <laughs> if that's if that's how we're gonna end the night. <laughs> Here I have one for you, Sarah. I haven't asked this one in a long time, though, but I'll ask. Um, so I run this fancy, really fancy contemporary art gallery in Seattle. And I love your work and I want to invite you to show one of your pieces, but I love them all. I can't pick one. <laughs> Um, which one would you choose to show? Oh, um, well, just let me know when you're available. I'm free pretty much all the time now, so I can be at your gallery in the next five minutes. But <laughs> um, I think it would be, I, my favorite piece is the datascapes. So I think it would be really cool to make those either print them on a canvas somehow or even just get them projected huge on a wall. Um, I think the data scapes would be the the thing that I think would I'd love to see in a gallery. Other than maybe seeing this full collage on a wall, but the data scapes, I think that's that's what I'd really like to to get in your beautiful gallery, Rick. I can't wait to see it. It's it's quite incredible. I bet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, unless we have someone who is ready to get that last question off their chest, I think we're going to wrap it here. And so to do that, we have to just congratulate Sarah one last time on an amazing job, a huge amount of work and beautiful art and creativity for us to enjoy. Thank you all so, so much.